Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for joining us here online. I know we're all online right now. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, tuning in, whether you're watching this in the morning or the afternoon, the evening, or sometime in the future. Uh, just glad you're here. Um, this morning, I wanted to run through a couple quick announcements before we watch a, a fresh video from our uh, parents and kids. And um, we have a little surprise this morning for you. Um, but a couple quick things. Uh, first being that with COVID, uh, we decided that for the next at least three weeks, we are going to just remain online exclusively on Sunday mornings. Um, we were unable to offer really any Sunday school. And so even if we did do a service, we'd be limited to, to under 50 people, probably only about 30 uh, actual attendees, apart from those who are volunteering. So uh, it didn't really seem to be worth it at that point to try and uh, launch a whole Sunday morning. So we're just going to stick online for the next little bit and we'll reevaluate in a couple weeks uh, based on the, the length of the lockdown as it continues. Hopefully it's done by the 6th and we're back in here worshiping uh, sooner than later. Uh, so we appreciate your patience. Uh, the good news is that in our sanctuary, we are still allowed 50 people. And so that means uh, some small groups can still meet here on specific nights. We can still do refresh. And I know that Maranatha this week uh, will be uh, meeting or, or sending something out online. Uh, but moving forward, uh, they, they can and, and I think will be able to meet here on Sunday nights or Friday nights or whatever night uh, your group wants to come in. So um, looking forward to being still able to do that. Um, with that, um, we're obviously course correcting a bit, but we appreciate your patience and your uh, generosity, your giving. Uh, just reminding you can still do that online uh, through our uh, portal on the website or uh, through um, e-giving. One other announcement, which is sort of a big announcement, and I don't know that it's a, a big secret, uh, but uh, Pastor Tony and Sarah, my parents, uh, they, were the, they have been and are the uh, founding pastors uh, here at Grace. Uh, they have been doing this for 25 uh, years, plus years, uh, in ministry in Fergus. Um, moved here from Scarborough uh, 26 years ago. They are uh, wanting to retire this year. And so uh, we are going to celebrate them in the fall, hopefully. But what we're doing in the midst of that is we are going to be looking for, we've already been looking for an admin, uh, and we are also looking to replace uh, Pastor Tony uh, as an associate pastor. And so we're looking actively now, as of today, uh, for a new associate pastor to replace uh, all of the work that Tones uh, has put in. And I know it's hard to replace someone like Tones, but we are going to uh, to to bring in someone who's obviously just a shadow of that, <laughs> uh, but it's someone who uh, is qualified. And so we've put together a job description uh, online. It should be on our website. And we're also going to be sending out an e-blast this morning because what we're really looking for is to find someone um, who potentially is already in ministry right now, uh, someone that we know, someone that you know that we don't know, and we're looking to spread the word uh, through, some, through some of our uh, just normal connections. So you may know of someone looking for a, a job or, or in, wanting to uh, you know, take a new adventure on in ministry. And so we encourage you to, to check out the job posting and share it with those people who you think it might apply to. And uh, the job posting makes it clear sort of what the job will look like. And if you have any questions, of course, about any of this, you can get a hold of me or you can, you can of course, talk to Tones. Um, he won't be leaving, uh, but he'll just simply be retiring, wanting to step down into, uh, uh, you know, out of full-time ministry. And he will remain on as an elder and, uh, and still be serving in our church, leading small group, being a part of our, who we are, uh, just won't be uh, full-time anymore. And so uh, he has just done an incredible job. We're so thankful for all that he's given. And uh, so we just say a huge thank you to them. And we'll, we'll be able to do that over the next year just to say how much we appreciate and love them. And uh, really, we're here because of them and, uh, and obviously God's work in them. So a uh, big thank you to them. And uh, so please spread the word. Let everybody know that that is what we're attempting to do is to look for and, uh, and find a, a new person uh, to take over that role. Awesome. Without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, our uh, parents, uh, a, a video that we put together on parenting. 
uh, and it uh, draws from some of our shared experience uh, uh, from our congregation. So enjoy. Yeah, we'll look right here. Okay. Hello, I'm Daniel, and this is Jackie. We go to Grace Church, even though no one's going right now. We have seven kids, but we want to talk about discipleship of children. Yeah, because let's be honest, it's hard. <laughs> But uh, one thing I like to do when I'm around is we have a soaking time when it comes to uh, our time with the Lord, where every kid has a Bible and a notebook, and we have ours as well. And we just listen to worship music, and we kind of spend time listening to the Lord, not just praying and asking God for things, but we just kind of hear, try to hear God um, individually, then we come together at the end collectively to kind of hear if God's giving a theme or not. And let's be honest, a lot of our kids... <laughs> are going to just draw and they're not going to share, but that's okay. We don't want to force anything yet at all. Not yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we want them to see us so they can have like kind of a framework to work around. I do try to have worship music playing in the background the whole time that we're doing school because I find if there's anything else in the background playing um, that the atmosphere of the home just becomes very chaotic. It's chaotic sometimes also when the worship music's playing but it definitely helps and the kids have kind of picked up on that. Um, if we don't have anything playing and it kind of gets crazy, one of the older girls just without even being told we'll go and turn on music and everything kind of calms down a little bit. Uh, I've been working through uh, two little kind of devotionally books, uh, but just teaching them that God loves them and uh, that who they are on the inside um, is okay like you're allowed to be that on the outside. I don't know how to say it. So for example, we're all created differently, right? So some of us are shy and some of us are very outgoing, um, but God's given us those gifts and who we are um, is beautiful. We, I, I'm not a big force, force feeding kind of guy. And that's why I have discussions at the table. I want them to think, cause especially in this, the world system, they, make, they tell you what to think. And we want to teach our kids to think and to hear and to be wise. And so, yeah, it's, it's different. We're going to fail. We fail a lot, but uh, we are quick to apologize because that's what we need to do. Like we, we're people too, and we fail, and we know they're going to fail, and we just have to have that grace for them, and uh, be open that we fail and that we are going to apologize when we make a mistake. God the kids bless. are banging down the door. Yeah, so the we kids are go. banging the door right now, which means we need to end. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Sarah Millard, um, and I am married to. Uh, Jordan and uh, we have two kids. Our oldest, our son, is England. He's six, and Florence, our daughter, uh, she is. She just turned four. When Lindsay first asked um, me if uh, I would participate in this, like, um, talk just on raising our kids and how we disciple them. Um, I said yes, and then immediately after I felt like I've just been not doing a great job of doing that and being intentional with our kids in that way. So just an encouragement and yeah, I just don't want anyone to watch this video and feel like they should feel guilty um, because I think right now, especially with COVID, like parents are we're really being pushed to the max and it's really hard and some days you just kind of feel like you're in survival mode so i just don't want anyone to feel like bad that they you know they haven't been as intentional as far as teaching them about the lord um, and working on their relationship with him yeah um, just wanted to to kind of encourage people so my sister, uh, Naomi McDonald, um, who also goes to church, you're going to hear from her um, as well. Um, we were raised in, um, we're the oldest of a large, large family, and we were raised in a Christian home. Um, and I think one of the things that our parents did really well was using other resources. Um, and they were just, they were good at... Um, at finding those different resources to help in in teaching us, um, one of the one of the things that I remember um, is always listening to this program called Adventures in Odyssey. It's teaching like 
life principles, Christian principles, and then also incorporating some scripture and, and Bible stories. Um, so that's something that we have our kids listen to all the time. They love it. Um, they listen in the car and um, before bed every night. And they're always telling me things that they've learned. Our kids also love watching uh, a show called Superbook. You can just find them on YouTube. Um, but they're actual Bible stories. Um, it really has helped them learn um, and kind of bring the Bible stories to life. And then with our kids too, we do try to like every night we pray with them. Um, we say a blessing over them. And then we try to use that time to let them talk and address any questions they have um, and just be a little more intentional um, there with our conversation like if they're you know sometimes they'll say that they had a bad dream last night so we'll we'll talk to them about you know like how god is with them and how they don't have to be afraid and then we'll we'll get them either them to pray and we'll pray for them and with them and also just i think a big thing for us is um just friendships are really, really important. I remember growing up, we had a lot of friends from church our, that were our, like kids of our parents' good friends and they all did, like they did small groups together. Um, they always had potlucks and Sunday lunches. So I think just surrounding yourself with other people that have kids your age, um, you can, and you can also help like disciple each other's children. So it doesn't always feel like it's just on your shoulders. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Naomi McDonald. Um, most people probably know me as Nance though. Um, I'm married to Alex McDonald and we have two kids, um, Logan who is three and Ellie who is two. Um, I am one of eight um, kids. Sarah Millard is my um, older sister and I'm the second oldest. Just something my parents were super intentional about um, was kind of just sharing the gospel and the impact that it has had on their life with us as kids. They were very intentional in, um, you know, reading the Bible with us. Um, my dad kind of off and on would do devotionals at dinner time. Um, but something that I think really had a huge impact on my family um, and is continuing to have the impact on us is my grandparents, my dad's um, mom and dad, prayed for us. They prayed for their children um, every night. And then they, you know, as grandchildren came along, they started to pray for each one of us by name and, you know, specifically what they were, you know, situations that we were encountering in that. And um, I think it, you know, it's had a huge impact on um, on you know my life it's had an impact on you know my cousin's lives um, and I think that we um, that I think that as, as parents that's crucial um, is that we pray for our children every night and um, I mean Logan's three years old I have no idea how we're doing you know I am just praying that God has grace on all my flaws and um, shortcomings and that you know God encounters our children at a young age um, you know just know that your children are also being prayed for by us and that we are you know so excited to see what God is going to do in the children of grace and um, another thing our family does is worship Alex is super passionate about worship um, so that's something he definitely has um, been intentional about in our family is like on an almost like, you know, daily basis, he's worshiping God. Um, and then the kids have like a harmonica and a ukulele that they join in. And I, um, you know, I encounter God in those moments and I, you know, just pray that God is speaking to my children in those moments as well, you know. We're three years in, so we're learning lots, and we would appreciate prayer for our children and for our parenting, and know that um, we're kind of all in this together, kind of learning. Hi, Grace family. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel, Pastor Mike's wife, and I have with me today 
What's your name? I'm two. You're two? And what's your name? Leo. Leo. This is my son, Leo. And we have four kids, Lucas, who is 12, Avery is nine, Noah is seven, and Leo is two. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up with a family of four kids. Um, we were always pretty involved in church. Um, we had a great youth group growing up, and I think that really helped with me um, learning about God and having a relationship with God. My parents also were very involved in worship. My dad played the guitar, led worship, and so we were always um, having music playing in the house and involved in that. My parents also blessed us every night before bed with a blessing that we now... <laughs> Does mommy say a blessing for you, Leo, every night before bed? Yeah. yeah, we pray for you, don't we? <laughs> we do. So those are the practical things about being involved in church, um, youth group, and good relationships. But I think on an emotional level, my parents always told us how much they loved us. And they could never say it enough. And I think that is invaluable to create a foundation of um, identity. And especially in a relationship with God, if you come to Him already knowing that you are loved, I think that's the best starting point. Um, so parenting our own kids, we've definitely taken some of those values. Um, I know that Mike and I are both like broken records when it comes to telling the kids how much we love them. And like, I can't, we can't say it enough. And it creates such a strong sense of identity. And then when it comes to encouraging a relationship with God for the kids, um, I'd say there's, you have to go through. Okay. When it comes to encouraging a relationship with God for our kids, um, we think that it, the most important thing is to lead by example because kids learn more from what you do than from what you say. So I've boiled it down to two things that are important for us. Um, the first is passion and the second is prayer. Um, I believe that God has placed passions in each of us and that we should chase these passions with abandon. Um, Mike and I are very cognizant of the kids being um, absolutely integrated into our journeys of following our hearts. For example, um, I'm an artist and I paint from my home. So the kids witness all of um, that journey, um, the hard work and the triumphs, but also the failures and the disappointments. Um, and I don't think there could be a better learning experience and opportunity of what chasing your dreams look like and for them to be able to live that with us. And we bring all of the highs and the lows to God and we do it together as a family. Um, so if, for example, if I'm working on a commission painting and I'm having trouble um, at the dinner table, table, I might say, kids, can we just all pray together? Like mommy is having such a hard time. Let's pray that this really comes together. And then when they see that come together and we're thankful to God for that, it's just an experience um, for them to put in their back, back pocket of um, how does this work? How does God walk alongside us through um, good times and bad times? I think that it's so important just to bless and say it out loud. I'm coming. Um, that the kids every night are covered and I'm coming, Leo. <laughs> I think that's probably all I have to say. Love you all. Bye. Meet me in the solitary. Meet me in the ordinary. Meet me in the sanctuary. Make my heart. Oh
Well, thanks everybody for uh, contributing to the video. It's just uh, full of wisdom and insight. So we just appreciate all of that. And uh, we're looking to do more of that kind of thing in uh, the coming months, uh, just to share the collective uh, wisdom that we have. And so I appreciate that. Uh, on to the message. It is a, a new series uh, kickoff Sunday. And so I want to just pray as we, uh, as we head in. Uh, we're going to read uh, the scripture in a few moments after we just intro a bit. So um, please prep your Bibles to John 16. So why don't we pray? Jesus, this morning we thank you for all of your work. It is finished at the cross and we stand in the shadow of Easter, Lord, knowing that you have risen from the dead, that you have made a way and that we live and move and have our being in this new life, Lord, in this freedom, in this grace. And we, we look towards, Lord, just this, our, our lives and the way that you're moving, the, what you're promising to us in the Spirit. And so we want to receive and grab hold of everything you have. So in our many words, Lord, would you, um, would you speak to us? Would you meet us here, Lord, as we listen in your name, Jesus? Amen. Well, we're about to begin a new series, and uh, it is about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And though the Holy Spirit is misunderstood, sometimes ignored, often avoided, and unjustly blamed for many things that we do, we must remember that the Holy Spirit is God. We, we must recognize that He is the greatest gift we'll ever receive. He is the ultimate truth. He is the reality of God's love, God's very presence with us. And we have but one choice in order, if, you know, if we want to cut through the noise of those on one side who have wrongly attempted to confine or deny the Holy Spirit's brilliance, and those on the other who so deeply and often misrepresent him. We only have one option, and that is we must turn to the, to the scriptures. We must look at what the scriptures tell us about the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're going to do. So just as we journey through Jesus' sayings about himself the last seven weeks, we're going to now look at the key passages in the Bible, mostly the New Testament, that explore the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And what it means for God to be with us. We're going to look at this beautiful idea of how God works, how the Holy Spirit speaks, how he moves, and then also how we respond and, 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 and walk in step with him. Um, and this is the hope for us in the series. And it's a, it's a deep hope, it's a deep longing for me, is that we would know and trust the Holy Spirit more deeply when we're done. Now, I don't say that flippantly because knowing and trusting the Holy Spirit are life goals for us, to know him and to trust him deeply. We know that when that happens, our lives can be radically changed. And so I'm just believing for that in, in us, even, even though we're not in person, that we're, you know, we're watching uh, virtually, I'm just believing that the, the presence of God would minister the word of God would teach and that, he, that you would hear God's voice and be challenged, invited, called into a deeper life with God. And that's certainly the desire of God this morning for you. So um, I know teaching about, you know, God, the Holy Spirit is a pretty big topic. Uh, so I thought I'd start with the story that would help us frame um, this opening message today. And so I wanted to tell you a story uh, by uh, author, pastor, uh, Mike Breen. Some of you may have heard of him through some of the 3DM stuff that we do in our discipleship groups. Um, he's the author of a, a bunch of different books. But he tells a story about a time that he got stuck in an airport in Toronto with his son. Now, he's not from Canada at all. He just was on a layover. And a snowstorm, of course, had grounded all the flights. And they were stuck. On that particular trip, Mike didn't normally travel with his son. He's a speaker and author, so he's invited to speak all over uh, North America. But he had invited his son, Sam, along that time because 
They hadn't been able to spend much time together in the previous month due to his, his busy schedule. And he had wanted to find, carve out some, some real father-son time for both of them. And so uh, the trip that they'd gone on uh, at West that had been a, a, just a really great success. But even better for Mike was this time that he got to spend with his son, eating meals together, you know, hanging out at night in the hotel. But now they're stuck in the airport, and so they've been together for, for you know, stuck together for days. And by the fourth hour in the airport, they have nothing to do. They find themselves attempting to retell all of the funniest stories that they could remember from growing up. You know, and you know how it goes when you get down those, those rabbit trails. One memory leads to another, which leads to another. And by the end, they've told so many stories. They're laughing so hard that they're like, stomachs are hurting. And, and everybody kind of around them is aware that these guys are sort of causing a commotion. And they're just having like a, a killer time together. Eventually, Sam gets hungry. He has to leave. Uh, so he, he's to find a vending machine, get some food. And a young man in his 20s who's seated just kind of across the room that Mike hadn't noticed. He didn't know him from, from Adam. He doesn't know who he is. He comes over across the room and he says, he says to Mike, I've been watching you and your son. And you seem to have a really great, like a really great relationship. Now, Mike's kind of shocked in that moment, you know, by the comment, a little bit embarrassed. But he says, well, you know, well, you know, thanks. Yeah, it's true. We do have a you know, really good relationship. And it becomes apparent as the guy's standing there that he was really prefacing the real reason why he came over. And so finally he, he works up the nerve and the young man looks intently and almost with, you know, intensity at Mike. And he says this to him. He says, you know, um, my wife and I are having our first child soon. It's a boy. And I would love to have a relationship with him like you have with your son. Could you give me like any advice about how I could raise him so I could have what you have? Now in that moment, Mike is just, he's blown away by this guy's earnestness, of course, his humility. And he's thinking, you know, anybody that's humble enough to, 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 to come across a room and ask for advice is cer certainly going to make it as a parent. And so he, he says, of course, you know, sit down, you know, and he shares with him, you know, his philosophy on parenting, sharing him about, you know, about God. He's, he's saying, you know, you know, for us, it centers around love and discipline and freedom and, and working those things out. He spends what ends up being the next three hours with the guy and his, you know, Sam come back and they're all talking together. And this guy's just peppering him with questions. And he's just, he's just trying to give him everything that he has because he recognizes this guy really wants to learn. Now, eventually the weather clears and they have to end their conversation. And, you know, begrudgingly the guy gets up and he, he ends up, they end up going their separate ways, thanking Mike for all that he's, he's shared with them. But Mike says, you know, on the surface, it doesn't seem like a really wild moment, but he said it's one of those moments that he has never been able to forget. He said it's now, it's now been a decade since that moment has happened, but, but I'll never forget it. He says, in fact, every time I board a plane, I think about that young man. Every time when I'm laughing and cutting it up with my son, I think about that young man. And the reason I think it's hard for Mike to forget that moment is because it was a moment that touched on something deeper that was at work within him. A moment that connected to a universal longing that is in, that's inside Mike, that's inside each one of us too. A longing that many of us are familiar with, not because we've had it met, but because we have only known the frustrating lack of it in our own lives. So what is it? What is it that made that memory stick, that moment stick? What is it that we all are desiring? And I think, I think this is what it is. That we're all longing for a guide. Just like that young man, we're all looking to find a true guide for the path of life that we're on. Someone that we can, you know, watch from across the room and then approach because we realize that they have something we don't, that they know the way to the place that we're called to go. 
We want to find, we all want to find someone that can come alongside us. How many of us want that? Someone to come alongside us, help us, take the time to teach us the way ahead. In fact, I think we all wish that there, there could be someone, someone out there that would search us out. Someone to help sort between all of our potential and then all of the other things that get in the way. Someone who isn't put off by our weakness or our wildness. I think we all long to find someone who not only deeply believes in us, but to find someone that we can also gen genuinely respect and admire. A guide that we can trust enough to lead us. This morning, my hope is that we realize that that is exactly who the Holy Spirit is. And all of that is exactly what he loves to do for us and with us. The Holy Spirit is the great guide and the influence we so desperately need in our souls. It's what everyone needs. Think with me, how many times in your career, maybe at work, as it, maybe you're an entrepreneur, maybe, maybe it's in the office, have you gotten to that moment, that trying moment where you wished, you just wished you had someone who could now help you to know what to do next? How many times have, have you or I as a young parent struggled to search out for that, the good advice for what is happening, how to deal with your kids, how to know how to walk with them? How many times as a young Christian did you wish for someone, maybe you're, maybe you're young right now, maybe you're a youth or you've just come starting to know the Lord you, and you're longing for someone to dis, help you discern God's voice, help you to make those big decisions, help you to avoid those big mistakes. That is exactly who the Holy Spirit is and who he wants to be for us. That's who he wants to be for you. See, we live in a world, it's full of people constantly vying for influence with us or, or, or wanting to take advantage of our influence with others. Just, you know, anybody can just make an account and you too can be an Instagram influencer, an Instagram mom, an Instagram star. It's a world of echoes, though. In it, we're tempted to join in with becoming obsessed with now having to manage our image, to being intoxicated with ourselves. It's a world set up of influencers and followers, likes and shares. And in the midst of all of it, the, you know, on one side is this media-saturated or, or driven culture that is constantly declaring to us the bad news, working to convince us of what's really wrong about the world and then also what's really, maybe what's right about it. And on the other side, we're bombarded by brands and their ambassadors telling us the bad news about ourselves, telling us then also what's really uh, wrong about us or what's really right about us in every aspect of our lives. And it's because they know if they can do that, they can sell us something that we're now convinced that we really desperately need. But in all of that, it's never truly pure. That influence is never truly pure. It's never altruistic. It's never for the greater good. It's never really selfless, is it? It's always angling to secure our agreement to get our likes, share this, share that, marketing their goods as the only true answer to meet, meet our needs and fix our problems. And yet we know, apart from all of it, apart from all of that, there's actually, there's something much different and much a much deeper kind of influence that's available. We're all aware that there's something better out there than what we're being offered. A hope in us to find Somehow, not just a guide that wants to use us, not a guide that just wants to sell us something, but a guide, a loving guide that could help us navigate this life. Man, we want that. Because apart from having that, when we live apart from a, a, a loving guide in our lives, we all know what happens. <laughs> These guides end up leading us, making us feel confused. They end up, we end up more distrusting. We end up more anxious. We end up more isolated. And you know what? We end up more angry, frustrated. At the end of the year, a year you know, of 
pandemics and, and lockdowns, we have to ask ourselves, whose influence do we see at work in our, in our hearts? Is it this anxious, confused, suspicious, you know, like um, distrusting, angry influence? Whose voice is speaking to us in the center of our soul? We're looking around saying, who can help us in the midst of a, you know, the world seemingly being on fire? And that's why I shared that story, because I think there is something that we're all looking for. And it's the kind of influence that is only born out of a sacrificial love. An influence we ask for, that we seek out, that we easily surrender to, because it's overflowing with a love that's gener- generously and graciously being poured out for us. And it's, it's not a romantic kind of love that's driving it. I'm talking about, it's, it's a fierce, unbreakable belief that you only find and recognize in fathers and mothers. And that's what I think Mike felt like inside, that, inside him that day. I think that's what we've all been longing for in our lives. Is to find a guide like that. And I think that's who the Holy Spirit is. My hope is as we study over these next you know, few months together these, you know, these, um, you know, these scriptures and these passages about the Holy Spirit, that we come home to the Holy Spirit. That we allow him to, to guide and lead our lives. That we, that we learn what it means to rest deeply, to trust deeply in his voice, in his way, in his grace. In fact, by the time we finish studying our passage today, even I hope that that we'll discover with more clarity the incredible way that the Spirit works and speaks and guides us. And so I want us to look at our first passage today, and it's it's we we've we've kind of almost touched on it in, in previous weeks, but it's found in John 16, and we're gonna read from verse 7 all the way to 15. So why don't we read it together? This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and, and you will see me, don't, you will see me no more. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have so many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, though, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me for he will take all that is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said he will take what is mine and he will declare it to you. This section that we just read is a part of a bigger section in John that stretches from chapter 13 all the way to 17. And it's one of the most extended teachings on the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit by Jesus in all of the four Gospels. And by this point in chapter 16, Jesus has already made it clear that the long-anticipated arrival of the Spirit of God will happen soon. And that it will be an indwelling. So the Spirit comes, and when He comes, He's going to indwell. God's very Spirit will actually fill people. The promise was that God will be with his people, not from the outside, from a distance, but at work deep on the inside. And when he comes, he's going to restore and heal, guiding us and empowering us. It's a beautiful promise. I have a friend who was and is a beautiful, a beautiful, stunning, a stunning person. But the problem was is that she didn't believe that or see that or understand that about herself. She, she couldn't 
not only not see it, she couldn't receive it on the inside. She had loved God faithfully in her life, and yet through it, she had gone through a lot. She had you know, gone through trauma and loss. And while she was surviving in her life, it, she, if she was to tell you, she'd say it was a struggle. There was, there was a constant battle with self-doubt in her life. It was a you know, nagging self-hatred, regret, worry. There was shame. And all of that had you know, come together to form a, a sort of a really secure wall around her heart. And, you know, her friends and families, they come around, you know, you try. And it seemed, you know, that, you know, you try to tell her otherwise. And, you know, even she was longing to, to receive that and, 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 and accept that herself, that love and affirmation. And yet, for a long time, she was just unable to deeply believe it. You know, she could understand the words and she could see the intent. And yet it didn't. It didn't land deeply. And the reality was, even if there had been a map of her soul, even if her her issues could have been dissected and understood on paper, the door of the heart, the door of her heart was still guarded and locked somehow. You couldn't get in. And here's the thing about the Holy Spirit's work uh, when he comes. He comes as the wisdom of God. When he lives in us and, you know, when he, when, he, when he fills us, he comes and he is the wisdom of God. He is not only the wisdom, but he's the power of God. He's the grace of God. And his work in us is from the inside out. And so what had seemed impossible, you know, this is, you know, years of, of, of kind of struggling through this stuff. All of it suddenly happened one day. God did what none of us had been able to do. God reached in and broke open in the most gracious way, broke down the lies and the fear and the doubt, that backlog of all of it, and the pure light of God's love broke in. With a simple prayer, walls fell down. I want to tell you, this is a beautiful moment watching God do what you cannot. And so in our passage, we find Jesus now turning to explain in broad strokes what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes and lives in us. And it looks a lot like what happens. It, it, it's, it's God restoring and, 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 and reworking and redeeming our hearts to make us like him. If you know God this morning, this is what the Holy Spirit, what Jesus is about to tell us, what we've just read, is, is what the Holy Spirit is at work doing within each one of us right now. We're all in the process, on the journey of God at work breaking down lies and and revealing love and grace to us in deeper and deeper ways. And so I want us to understand in principle what what the Holy Spirit does when he's living inside of us. When we say yes to God, what it looks like to be filled. And in this passage, in the verses we read, you can break it down into two, two categories. The first is that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, his ministry, his ongoing ministry is to convict us which is what you see in verse 8 to 11. And the second part is that he will declare to us. And that's what you see in verses 12 to 15. Three convictions, three different kinds of conviction that the Holy Spirit brings and three declarations that he makes. And I want us to look the three convictions in verse 8 to 11 that he makes. It says this, and I'll just reread it for us. It says, he will, when he comes, convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, And judgment. Sin because they do not believe in me. Righteousness because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. And judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, when we hear the word conviction, we want to ask ourselves, what does that mean? What What does conviction mean? What does it mean that the Holy Spirit will come and when he lives in us, he'll convict us? Well, the word means that he'll convict us of error. It means to show us that we're wrong, where we're wrong. It's, um, I think it's an occupational hazard of being the spirit of truth. Your presence reveals the root of what's really wrong in us. Now, here's the thing, is when we think about the Holy Spirit convicting us, the enemy wants us to only read the headline. He wants us to see those bold letters 
and be afraid. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit exposes you. The Holy Spirit, you know, takes you into the light and, you know, like hangs you out to dry. And, and when we hear that, just read that sort of headline, you know, you know it's, it's easy to think, you know, well, who wants to be around that person? Maybe, you know, sheesh, you know, like, here I am, Lord, trying to do, you know, my best. And all you can do is, you know, if you come and you live inside of me, you're going to be that kind of like super judgy friend. You're going to be like Debbie Downer on steroids. You're going to be overbearing. You know, the spirit of truth is here. He's going to be demanding about all the little things that we need to now make right. And see, that happens. We think like that. Sometimes that's our picture of God, our picture of the Holy Spirit, is we just think, you know, he's going to come in and he's just going to start turning tables in our lives. And, you know, he's going to, you know, it's going to be, you know, brutal and painful. And, and that, that only happens when we don't read this whole passage well. We will misunderstand what the conviction of the Spirit is really all about. See, we need to unpack what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to convict us because it, fun, because it involves finding out that we're wrong. It says about three important things. So let's read a little deeper. It says we're wrong. He's going to come and, and show us that we're wrong about three important things. We're wrong about sin. We're wrong about righteousness. And we're wrong about judgment. Okay. And, and if we're going to think about it, we could think about it this way. He comes into this world to show us that we're wrong about what's really wrong with the world. That we're wrong about what's really right about the world. And we're also wrong about who really won. Wrong about what's wrong, wrong about what's right, and wrong about who's won. So let's break those down. How are we wrong about what's wrong with this world? Jesus says we're wrong about the way we understand sin. And sin is what's wrong with the world. So we're wrong about the way we understand sin because sin, he says, is really about not believing in him. Sin for those who aren't Christians is having rejected Jesus outright. So that's what sin is. It's saying, I don't want, I'm saying no to Jesus. And for Christians, sin is having, it's the same way, just on a smaller scale. Sin is having places in our lives that have yet to be renewed and restored by God. Sanctified. And what Jesus is clarifying is that while sin manifests in all sorts of behaviors in, 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 this, in our lives and in the world, the root of sin that he's concerned about is unbelief. The root of sin is unbelief. And it's unbelief that the Holy Spirit has come to convict us about. That's what's on his agenda. He's come to show us that we're wrong about what's really wrong with the world. See, most people we know, if we asked those, you know, our friends or neighbors, if you went on Facebook and you posted, you know, a question, what is wrong with the world? You'd get a list of all all sorts of wrongs that people see at work in the world, injustice, brutality, brokenness, we could go on. And all of those things that were written down that were wrong would be, I'm sure, very wrong indeed. But would any of them understand the root of what lies beneath all of that? What lies underneath? What causes, what leads to all of this behavior? Would they know that the cause of what is really wrong in the world is that the world has rejected Jesus. That is the Holy Spirit's work in the world and in our hearts to remind us that if we're going to beat sin, if we're going to beat things, you know, brokenness and injustice and brutality, if we're going to overcome all of that stuff, all of the sin, it's not solved by managing, it's not an issue of managing our behaviors. We don't just deal with injustice by by. by by enacting laws at the end of the day. But Jesus says you actually deal with injustice and brokenness in the world by believing what Jesus has told us. Isn't that wild? I asked Lucas and Avery the other day to think about an oak leaf, to, uh, to think about an oak branch, and then to think about the trunk of an oak tree. And I asked them, which part of that isn't an oak? Isn't an oak? And they said, well, all of them are oaks. All of them are part of the oak. And then I said, okay, well, if, all, if every part is part of the oak, think now about the oak key or the seed of an oak tree. Within that key, in seed form, is the potential for all of the things to come out of it, right? Leaves, roots, branches, trunks. 
And so if you see an oak tree, you know that there, that came from an oak key that had fallen to the ground and, you know, got maybe, maybe an acorn got buried by, by a squirrel. That is what the Spirit is at work doing in us, going about in our hearts, ridding us, not just of the, the leaves or the root or the trunk, or the, but the seed of sin by exposing how we've all, we've all been caught up managing sin instead of eradicating it via faith. So I want us to understand something. See, sin in our lives and, in, and also in the world isn't primarily to be thought of as just any immoral action. I mean, we can label things, that's sin or sinful, right? But sin isn't just immoral action. Sin isn't just the leaf of an oak tree or the branch of an oak tree, even the trunk of an oak tree. Sin comes from the seed of unbelief in our hearts and in the hearts of people. Wherever this, the seed of unbelief has taken root, you will find sin. And some of it is sin, you know, small sin, and some of it's big sin. Unbelief is disconnection, and sin is any action that flows out of a heart that's disconnected from God. And the, and the Spirit now, though, his primary concern in us is to reconnect us and keep us connected to God. His, his way of dealing with sin isn't to now deal with sin management, but to connect us and to, to open us up to all of God's grace. He has no desire, the Spirit has no desire to manage our bad behavior by guilt or shame or fear or condemnation. That's not the work of the Spirit. That's like pruning, you know, some sort of weed tree with the expectation that somehow by pruning it or managing it, it could become a maple tree one day. I used to have these terrible weed trees in my backyard. I had, I, had, I had almost a dozen of them. And it didn't matter what you did. You could prune them all day long. But they, you know, they, they're still a weed tree. You know, like it didn't matter what I did. They're still ugly. They still drop leaves. They still make a mess. See, the enemy, he would love all of us to get tied up in sort of a stiff, religious, self-empowered obedience where we're just trying to manage our sin. But if we want to beat out sin in our lives, if we want to, to, to say no to sin, the spirit inside of us is showing us that the way forward is not by managing it, but by learning an obedience that flows out of faith, an obedience that flows from connection to God, an obedience that flows from knowing the love of God. So we're wrong about what's wrong. And the Holy Spirit is there to remind us of that, that you don't have to manage your sin anymore. I mean, that's just really beautiful news. I'm excited about that. I couldn't manage my sin if I tried. And what that leads us to is not, not only are we wrong about what's wrong, but inevitably, because we're wrong about what's wrong, we're also wrong about what's right. Jesus says that this world is wrong about what righteousness is because he says, I go to the Father and you'll see me no more. What's the most right thing in this world? Again, we could, you know, post it on Facebook. What is, what is the best part or the best thing in this, in this world, in this life? And I'm sure another list would ensue. But here's what we want to assert this morning is the most right thing in the world was and is the life, the ministry, the person of Jesus. Jesus is perfect righteousness. He's perfect. He's the best. He's the ultimate. His life is life to the fullest. His love is truest love. Now, how does that square up with what we hold up as right or good? Imagine going up against Jesus in sort of a righteousness competition, like kind of like a science fair. You know, you're sitting there, you show up and you say, well, um, I made a ship out of paper that floats in this little, you know, thing of water for two minutes before sinking. And the previous world record is one minute and 55 seconds. And Jesus comes in, he says, listen, I've made humans so that they can walk on water. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't compare. How are we doing? Not that, not that good. You know, you, you come and you, you, know, you, you present your righteousness before God and you say, listen, God, I did so great. I held back all the, the, the bitter, evil thoughts ahead of my head when I was mad at that person who hurt me. And they didn't even know that I, you know, I didn't even let it out. I didn't show them that I was actually holding a grudge against them for like the last two years, right? And then Jesus stands up and he says, you know, the moment 
that in the very moment that you hated me, I was giving my life for you. Right? How are we doing in comparison? Not that well, right? So the Spirit's work is he comes to reveal and remind us that our righteousness is lacking. His presence, his voice inside us pleads with us not to place our identity on on such a shoddy performance (laughs) in our own righteousness. Righteousness in this case means what is the rightest or truest or most optimal way of living, right? And so here is Jesus saying, the Spirit is going to come and he's going to show you that the way that, <laughs> that you've all been living in this world is woefully short of God's desired purpose for your life. Jesus has been saying with his words and with his works, everything that he's, he's the miracles, the teaching, uh, and, and then his love is that he wants us to see that there is another way to live this life. There's actually more to this life. There's actually life beyond death. He's saying, look at my life. This is the way. This is, this is the righteous path. This is the right way. And this is what life is meant to be like in all of its splendor. And he's saying, come to me and find that not only am I the, the source of all life, but I'm the open doorway into that life. I've made a way for you. And not only that, that if you come to me, I'm also the path that you can follow in this life. I'll, I'll actually be the guide for you so that you live this life without ever slipping or falling. And the reason that he gives that to us, the reason why he he convicts us about how we're wrong about righteousness is that so that we know that our righteousness is lacking. I'm sorry, the reason that that he gives to us so that we know that our righteousness is lacking is that he's He's come from the Father in order to go to the cross, atone for our sins, and be resurrected and then ascend. So he's saying, you know this is true because I wouldn't have to die for you if there wasn't a problem with sin. I wouldn't have to die for you if there wasn't a problem that with, all, uh, um, with you all understanding the right way to live. And so his catchphrase for this is he's saying, listen, you got righteousness wrong, and, and that's why I have to go to the Father. That's his catchphrase for his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. All of them are leading up to this moment where he goes back to the Father, victorious, vindicated, proven right. But that conviction the Holy Spirit brings about our lack of righteousness isn't just, um, isn't just that our way has been insufficient, But it's also that through the cross and resurrection of Jesus, we can have Jesus' way actually become our way. We can actually, you know, have, you know, his righteousness, you know, become our righteousness. We can come home by simply believing his words, having faith. And we can have the Spirit fill us and then begin to renovate our lives. When we think about conviction... The Holy Spirit convicting us. It's not just that we've got it wrong. The conviction is also pointing, saying, but Jesus got it right, and he wants to give it to you, and that's why I'm here. See, the Holy Spirit's conviction isn't just that there's bad news about the way that we've been living, but that Jesus has good news for us. And that's the basis. It says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Right? This leads us to the third work of the Spirit's conviction, and and, and it's this. The world is wrong about who won. In this, Jesus is, he's pointing to the cross that he's about to go to. See, See, the cross of Good Friday that we just experienced last week, you know, it looks like defeat. Jesus hanging there on the cross to the disciples, to everybody who is watching to the, to, the, to the enemy, to Satan, and all of, his min- all of his minions, his powers and principalities, Good Friday looked like defeat. It looks by all, like all accounts that the enemy, the accuser, has somehow triumphed over Jesus. And in our lives, it can often feel like that too, can it? Aren't there places and moments where it can feel like everything is lost, that it's finally the end, That the relationship is over, the opportunity is not going to work out, the dream has died, that God somehow isn't going to come through, that impossibilities, even though we had hoped, 
aren't going to become possibilities. In this, the promise of Easter, the promise of the Holy Spirit is that he's come and he lives within us and he is declaring the good news. He's declaring a different word to us. He's declaring the truth of what really happened on Good Friday. What really happened on Easter Sunday. The truth that what looked like the ultimate betrayal and murder was actually the ultimate obedience and surrender. What had looked like defeat was actually God's great victory. That we were wrong about the final score. Because though Jesus died, yet he lives. And though the very one who has accused us, the one who has tempted us and afflicted us and persecuted us and tried to destroy our lives, it's actually he who stands judged and condemned before God, not us. His power in this world is broken. We get to discover that with Jesus by the, by, the, by the spirit within us, is he's reminding us of that truth. That is the, the apostolic gospel, is that the enemy has been defeated. The power, his power is broken. His influence is fading. His kingdom has fallen. The spirit within each one of us convicts us of these beautiful, beautiful truths. The first is that you don't have to manage your sin anymore. Jesus tells us the Holy Spirit is here to teach us how to live by faith. You don't have to perform anymore in this life. The Holy Spirit says, I'm here to impart Jesus' righteousness to you. I'm here to lead you into life. And then thirdly, you don't have to live in defeat or fear or hopelessness anymore. His presence, his presence is the fullness of life. If the Holy Spirit is inside of you, there is hope and there is life that cannot be quenched. There is a love that is stronger than death. There is a love that overcomes the grave. There is a love that is greater than your darkest problem and deepest secret. There is a love that overcomes and reworks and renews and restores every broken thing in our lives. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, he is declaring to us that beautiful word. That he's here. Because he's here, we can have life and life abundant. That is why Jesus then says in verses 12 to 15, why he says three times that this, the ministry of the Spirit isn't just conviction, but it is declaration. He's in in us. And even now, I, I imagine the Holy Spirit in you is shouting just as he's shouting within me. The good news. He doesn't just whisper the truth to us. He declares the truth of the good news to our souls every day. He is the greatest preacher in the history of the world. Let me tell you this. He is the guide that we're all longing for in this life. He is actually the one that we can fully trust to lead us. He is the wisdom that we're all longing and searching for. He is the power to change the places in our lives that are, that are frustrating us. He's the grace that empowers us to go out on mission. He's the love that anchors our, all, our whole identity. And so this morning, I just want you to listen for a moment because the Holy Spirit is declaring the good news inside of you. And if, you know, if you're a Christian this morning, if you know God, we can just, we can just pray that prayer. Come Holy Spirit. Come and speak. Let me hear your words this morning. Let me hear the good news again. Teach me and lead me into life. If that's you, we can just simply again renew. We can ask God, take us deeper. We're going to pray for that in in a moment. But I just wanted to, to ask you this morning that if you're listening and you do not yet know Jesus, you don't yet know or you haven't yet said yes to him, I want to encourage you this morning that you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to try and manage your life anymore. That if you've been searching for the one who loves you in the midst of your weakness or your brokenness, your shame or your fear, the one who's with you in the midst of every storm, if you've been wondering 
if maybe that might be Jesus, I want to encourage you this morning just to say yes to God. Yes, Lord, this morning. I, I want you to come. I know that you, you paid the price for, for my disconnection. That, that there's real life if I just simply say yes and believe and trust. So if that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you to pray that prayer together with me before God. Lord, why don't we do it right now? God, come. I'm sorry, Lord, that I've done this on my own. I want to know your new life. I want to be connected to you. And even more than that, I want to welcome your spirit to live in me. And I want you to fill me with that life. I want you to come and be the guide for my soul. Come, Holy Spirit. I just want to encourage you that if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'd love for you to just connect with us and just let us know. We want to encourage you in that journey. But I want to pray for each one of us as well who's watching and already has a familiarity in some level with, this, with the Spirit of God. You're, you know, you're already working and letting Him move in your life. And I want to just pray for you right now that God would do, do that even deeper. So why don't we pray, God, come and be our guide. Show us the truth about Jesus. You alone have the words of life. Come and use these next weeks to take us deeper. Show us more of who you are. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Would you go in the power and the grace, the wisdom and the love of the Holy Spirit?